like it's a privilege that success for me is is purpose um, and so I I feel most successful when I feel that I'm living out my purpose on the day to day and I measure that daily I measure that weekly a wonderful day to you. It is great to be in your company yet again. If you're joining us for the first time, but if you've been here before, well, welcome back. I'm thrilled to be in your company at this moment. This is the LeadyB podcast second episode of our second season. And in this podcast, I have the privilege of speaking to the University of Pretoria's alumni from all over the world to find out about their success stories. Uh, since the University of Pretoria is one of the largest producers of research in South Africa, its impact has been felt beyond the shores of Africa. I'm your host, Lennox Wasara, a scholar and uh, award-winning presenter. I'm uh, today thrilled to be chatting with Yolanda Duplessis-Martin all the way from New York. The schooling journey began at the University of Pretoria's uh, Taxport High School, where she matriculated, and Yolanda spent many years at Taksuming, where she was pursuing her Olympic dream. And uh, after graduating with a cum laude in the U.S. with majors in Global Interdisciplinary Studies and Political Science. She worked at Deloitte's renowned Chief Financial Office Program, where she started off. And uh, presently, she is a management consultant at uh, Deloitte Consulting, where she's uh, also got the privilege of working with some of the best companies in the world. Yolana, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm very honored and deeply privileged to be here with you today. Yeah, so I consider myself uh, quite lucky because I realized that you and I have one thing in common in that we both studied at the tax board high school and you were actually the first uh, head girl at the school uh, back in your time. Uh, what did this do to you? Like, how was this impact on you uh, as a person, your self-esteem? What was it like? Wow. Um... You know, when I look back at those formative years, I, I feel so grateful that I, I have such joyful memories of that season in my life. Um, I was recruited into a tax board high school at 13. So I moved out of my high school where I was. I grew up on the East Rand um, and moved into the boarding school, uh, the lockers as they're known. And I was there through matric and then obviously continued to stay there when I was studying at tax for, for two years. Um, and just the experience, I think, of being in a, a program like that, such a high performing academy um, where the pursuit is the Olympics for everybody, right? The, the pinnacle of, of sporting success. Um, but I think more than just sort of that, I think there so much of who I am today was formed in those formative years, right? Like living in boarding school changes you. Anyone can probably relate, but the relationships and the friendships you build, um, you know, just living in a space where everybody's sort of pursuing excellence at the high performance center, um, being so privileged to wake up such a beautiful campus every day. It was just such a beautiful season in life. I'm so grateful for that. But I think so much resilience and the drive and going through the grind and um, dealing with adversity, all of that was built in those, those formative years on that, on that campus. So I'm just very thankful for it. Yeah, that's true. You spoke a bit about that time actually built a lot of resilience here. And you spent seven years uh, tuck swimming, you know, um, from the high school into the university as well uh, with tuck swimming. And then you had the big dream of going to the Olympics. And then unfortunately, you had an injury that set you back quite a bit. How did you deal with that? Because now you had to tap into that bank of adversity uh, resilience. Um. I had lots of injuries. <laughs> Sadly, my career was filled with many injuries. At my first surgery, my shoulder surgery, when I was like 14 years old. But um, the big injury I ended up having was a back injury that I actually got as I was like matriculating. And it was right after probably the best competition of my career uh, when it was Junior World uh, Championships. Um, but I think... I really had to sort of dig deep in that season. I think, you know, I, I got a back injury and it affected my training and, you know, things started going sort of south from there. But I think what I was dealing with was sort of depression at the time that I was getting from the injury. Um, you know, I diagnosed sort of depression and was put on uh, medication at the time. 
Um, and I had to sort of continue performing with an injury and try to perform. Ultimately, that didn't sort of go the way I planned it. Um, and I think a lot of folks, and this is very common for athletes, when you don't mm. hit this big goal that you've been working for, you end up hitting this sort of low and really deep seasons of depression. I think people get it when they don't make the Olympics. And I think people think people get it who even go to the Olympics mm. um, and get it after coming back, right? You come off from such a high. So I think sometimes it's inevitable that you're going to have to go through a season of just sort of, I call them the valleys. And so I went through that season of like my valley, but it was honestly the, a life changing season for me. And I think, you know, dealing with the injuries, I can say I probably didn't handle them the best. I didn't know how to work my emotions through what I was going through. I didn't know how to communicate what I needed at times. <laughs> Um, and sometimes, you know, at that season of life, I was so young, I was sort of 17 or 16, um, you know, I, I would shut down when I was having a really hard time. I didn't know how to communicate what I needed. And so I look back and I'm like, I probably didn't sort of deal with it the best way. Um, but things played out the way they played out. And now I look back and I think, um, and I think of that time of like not hitting going to the Olympics is probably the greatest thing that ever happened to me because it changed the course of my life. It changed me as a person. Um, and when I look at my swimming career, I think maybe my, my purpose and my, my goal wasn't to go to the Olympics. And I was fine with that part. I feel very at peace with it. I think what I've walked away with was the process of what those seven years did to me. It's the process that made me rich. It wasn't the outcome. It wasn't the Olympics title. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful I didn't go to the Olympics. And I, I feel so at peace saying that because, like I said, it, it was probably the most life-changing experience I could have gone through. Yeah, you spoke about the process. I want to tap into that a little bit because listening to you, I'm really tempted to ask, what would you do differently then? Because you identified that there were some ways that you were not really handling the situation, but how would you handle it now? How would you deal with it now? Wow, such a good question. I think the first thing is just um, communicating what I need um, and, and communicating that in a way that's sort of effective would be the first thing. Um, I think I would take a little bit of pressure off myself. I, I think you know, everybody can reflect back on a season differently, right? And even the people that were in that sphere with you going through it, whether it's your coach or your managers, they can reflect back on you differently. But my experience from my standpoint is I felt a lot of pressure about being the first Black per, uh, swimmer to go to the Olympic Games. I, I felt sort of pressure and like talk about that. And I took it on a lot. I was dealing with injuries that I had no control over. My, I hurt my back in the gym and it... It, it, it ached endlessly. Um, but I think what I would do differently is just to um, not take on so much of the pressure and the noise. Um, I would try to focus a lot more on enjoying the moment um, and just realizing what a gift and a privilege it is to even be in that position that I was in. You know, with I had extremely humble upbringing. Um, my mom was a single parent to two girls and, you know, where I was and the things opportunities I've had is nothing I could have ever dreamed of as a child and so I, I missed the joy a little bit and that's what I would change is just to soak in the joy of being healthy being fit yeah. getting to dive into a pool every day um, because I had that for a long time but I lost it in those sort of last remaining years of my career so that's what I would change but that's a great question I actually haven't thought so deeply about this <laughs> it's such a long time <laughs> so thank you for that <laughs> that's that's incredible because I, it's also something that I thought about as well in the sense that uh with when things were not going so well with my golfing uh at some tournaments didn't go too well you know you get so caught up in your head about so many things you know because yeah. you're around so many competitive people within the school itself so I guess uh, I'm glad that uh, joy was the answer for you. And yeah, uh, I guess perspective is what I always say now too, is like step a little bit out of just the situation you're in, because when you're in this sort of really intense world, that's all you can think and see, but you have to have some perspective that the world is much bigger than just this moment and the, the time that's on the clock, you know, or the games you win. So. Yeah. yeah. And the world being a bigger place, your story was part of a bigger story as well, because after the seven years at uh, 
the High Performance Center, you then moved on, you went overseas, moved to the US, and uh, quite an interesting shift, one would say, or an interesting transition. Uh, what inspired this move for you? Yeah, it actually was all inspired out of that moment that I told you, hitting just the lowest low I think I've ever been after not making the Olympics. Um, I think, you know, like many athletes, like I said, I, I went through sort of a phase of depression um, and I just felt really lost. I felt like a void. Um, but one thing that also I was really struggling with is this sort of singular identity that grew out of being an athlete. And I think many athletes can relate to this. You're known as a soccer player, you're known as a netball player or a swimmer. And it can, it started feeling suffocating for me in a strange way. I felt that I was always more than just the singular identity that was put onto me. And so in my heart birth, this dream or this desire to be, um, more multidisciplinary and seen more multidisciplinary and more layered than just sort of Yolanda the swimmer. And that sparked in my heart a desire for change. I didn't know what the change was. Um, I was also scared of change because in many ways I was very happy with where I was living. I, I had the best of everything, right? There was nothing I was lacking. So my decision yeah. wasn't out of a lack, but it was a desire for more you know being seen more more differently and so originally I just sort of was looking to figure out what type of change I can bring to be honest moving to the U.S. was the last thing on my mind but uh, this sounds crazy but I um when I had my own personal prayer time I truly felt like that was what God told me he said that you you have to go to the U.S. and it was nothing I ever wanted if you knew me in high school you would know I was not into the U.S. and moving here um right. and so it was like oh my goodness what it you know and it took a lot of faith um, and took, I had lots of miracles happen on how the move went. You know, I, I moved here with nothing, no money, no family to fall back on. Um, and I could do nothing but survive here because I had no choice but to, um, you know, there was no money for a turn ticket home, you know, yeah. um, and that's what sort of sparked it. And so I was honestly heartbroken leaving Pretoria and making that transition but I'm so grateful I just took the chance on myself I'm, I'm grateful that I just followed what I thought was the God's will for my life in that moment um because everything sort of played out the way it was supposed to <laughs> so that's what sparked the the big move um and um yeah the rest is history I guess yeah I like the fact that you uh, alluded to your spiritual a life that helped you tap into, uh, I guess, a new life uh, out yeah. of the U.S. And uh, whilst you were there, when you completed your studies in the U.S., you had to tap into a new identity as well, uh, uh, moving away from that singular identity you referred to. And now, upon graduation, you're uh, fortunate to get a job, a good job, I must say, uh, doing the, the program, uh, the CFO program with Deloitte Consulting. How was that for a first job? Oh, my goodness. Such a miracle, such a gift. Um, I, to be honest, when I, when I studied what I, my goal was to become a diplomat. And so I studied, as you know, global studies, political science, I minored in Russian language, was doing all the things to tick the boxes to set myself up to be a successful diplomat. Um, and so um, I, I was, my, the plan was once I graduate, I'm going back to South Africa, I'm going to go pursue the part, either do my master's and you know, we'll try to get into sort of in internship programs or learnerships. Um, and two months before moving back, I actually even had a plane ticket booked back to come back. Um, there was a woman uh, that I was, I was swimming. I'd already sort of, I was done swimming, but I was swimming at the university I was at. And she had been taking sort of private lessons um, there. And she was, we were changing in the, in the, change room and she said to me oh like aren't you graduating soon what do you want to what are you going to do with your life you know the big question everybody asks you when you're graduating it's the dreaded question I should say and I said well I want to be a diplomat and you know I'm really uh, care about social justice issues I want to make an impact on the world and she's like oh you know I have friends that do that type of thing and she's like would you like to connect with them I was like, sure and um i totally underestimated her connections but one of the connections I, I I spoke on the phone the following week with two of her friends and one was the at the time the president of the United Nations Democracy Fund and the other was 
a forensic accounting working on some very big political um, initiatives and he worked for Deloitte and so um, I was just sort of chatting to him about Korea what he does because he worked a lot on the African continent um, and um, he said to me we had just such a fabulous conversation and very to my surprise he said to me I'd really mm. like for you to work for us and I was like honestly I didn't even really know what Deloitte was like I was liberal arts major had no interest in corporate so it was like um excuse me and he's like yeah I'd like you to work for us and that's what started it um the conversation and then of course and um it took a lot of miracles because I needed a visa to stay longer and um but everything just fell in its place I got the interviews and um and then I got this job in New York and so I thought I can't turn down a job in New York this is like yeah. oh my word I just landed a job in New York right like I came up to interview I did the whole thing and I mean, I know even if people in the US dream of this moment, right? And here I am, this girl from the East Rand that just did this thing. Um, and so I thought, I'm going to do this for two years and then I'll sort of come back. But then more other opportunities started landing on my plate. And so time has gone on in like 10 years now. I've, I've been in New York. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> that's sort of how the job came. And I feel so thankful. It was a very big job to start my career. I would say the early days were brutal. I, I'll tell you, there's a lot of the times I had to dig deep into that grit that I, I yeah. learned. It, you know, at Tux, um, the New York is a beast to work in. And, um, and I think even adding working for such a powerful firm. And so I stayed up a lot of late nights in the office, you know, keeping the lights on. And I, I had to learn a lot of really hard lessons on my, on my own in those early days. But I'm so thankful I, I, I stuck with it. I'm so thankful for like my resilience to, to hold on, even when I honestly felt like I wanted to give up a lot of the times because, and so it's taken me really far and I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, indeed, that's a rich experience. Uh, fast forward to now where you're in your role as a manager at Deloitte uh, Consulting out in New York, as you mentioned, that it's quite intense there. Uh, one wonders as to your opportunity to work with Fortune 500 companies and to probably work with some of the top performing companies revenue wise in the, in the US, which is truly big stuff uh, in corporate terms. How has this shaped your view on success at this point? I think my, my view of success has evolved throughout my life. I think, you know, when I was a five-year-old growing up in the home in my humble beginnings, success was like, I just want to graduate high school because majority of the folks in my family didn't even finish high school and that in itself is a privilege, you know? And so I, I had targets of things that were success, you know, in swimming, the, the, the success was whatever the clock told me. Right. Um, and I think that is for most athletes, how you define it. And I do feel like it's a privilege that success for me is, is purpose. Um, and so I, I feel most successful when I feel that I'm living out my purpose on the day to day. And I measure that daily, I measure that weekly. Um, I've never sort of felt the need to have these titles, right? I've been very yeah. suc successful here in my corporate career, but it's really not that that's fulfilled me or made me feel successful. It's been the moments of purpose. And I think my purpose has always been to encourage, inspire and equip people to be their best selves. And on days when I feel that I'm living that out, I, um, I feel most fulfilled. And I, I feel that I'm truly walking in the calling that I was called to. And um, whether that's with my clients or the people that I lead. So yeah, I sometimes I get to sit in these amazing boardrooms here in New York or in Los Angeles where I travel a lot. And I sit with C6 c-suite executives from really powerful companies but ultimately i don't see a cfo in front of me i don't see a cio i see a human who is like trying to make really hard decisions on a day-to-day -day, just like everybody else it just happens that they've got you know made massive revenue in their hands that they need to care for but um you know they're just human and i think that being able to just see the human and, and helping them show up as their best selves and helping them make really tough choices is what gives me fulfillment. So yeah, that's how I just see success. Like, that's how I see my days. Yeah, a purpose-driven life indeed. And uh, there's also a general assumption that a lot of people have, 
I guess, particularly one would imagine, I guess, in Africa or in South Africa, uh, specifically that if you are abroad, it's a sign of success. Has that been uh, the feeling on your side there in New York? I would say no, because, well, and I think it's varies for folks, because again, I think it's about how you define success and it's always tied, to, should be tied to your core values. Um, you know, for me, I, I think I could still have the same live out my purpose, no matter where I am in the world. It is just that it happened that this is the place where God has put me. But I think the perception, and I know this is the case, is that, oh, you made it here, you made it there, therefore you're, you know, successful. But I think a lot of people that even sort of immigrate or go work in other places are, are struggling. They have the same you have the same issues you would deal with if you were at home. Maybe some unique challenges culturally, obviously, or even with load shedding or things like that. But yeah. like generally the day to day, you're still going to have the same issues. And so I think there is a lot to be said about going abroad and, and doing a good thing. But I hope that everybody no no matter way you just find success, you um, remember that it's a lot more than sometimes just like, being in a cool city. I don't take it for granted, but for me, it's not really been the case. I, I think because I believe in purpose so much, I truly believe I can live that out no matter what, um, you know, geography I'm in, so. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, people are wondering, well, I guess uh, looking for a job overseas might not be the answer uh, <laughs> if you are leading a purpose-driven life, as you mentioned. Yeah, if that's what, and, and again, I think if that's what people want, um, I think pursue it, right? Yeah. But I, I think for my case, I think it's about purpose. And so, um, yeah, I live into that. I like that. And I like that about, you know, I like this, that about this whole conversation that it's uh, really been driven from that perspective. And I could really feel the energy and the excitement you have uh, talking about this. And I think it's carried you through quite a lot uh, that you've experienced. But my, one, my mind wonders as to where to next, you know, where would you see yourself in the next couple of years? Uh, would you still see yourself out in New York doing the same type of work or maybe transition to entrepreneurship? Uh, very fascinated by that. What would you say? Oh, my goodness. Um... Lately, because I'm I'm a new mom, I'm just figuring out how to make it. To uh, congratulations! Week. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just figuring out how to make the next week. I think, I think in the short term, my vision is just figuring out being a successful um, professional, uh, prof you know, and a mom and, and a wife and a friend um, and a, a sister to the world. I just, I'm trying to figure out all these new roles and that's sort of a short term where I see it. I think long term, I mean, I obviously, I either would love to become a C-suite in an organization um, where I really can influence folks at a larger scale or um, and then also maybe do some sort of like leadership development and coaching. Um, I'm really passionate about like mentoring and, and coaching uh, junior folks. Yeah. I think I've had enough adversity in my life that I do, I find such a great um, well that I dig into in order to um, share wisdom with others. And so it's something that's brought me a lot of like passion and joy. So I, I'd love to do something along that lines as well. And I'm very fascinated to find out from your side, given your your story and your experience, uh, what what lessons did you learn from your time at the University of Pretoria, and how has it helped you succeed at this point? I think the first lesson that comes through is leadership. I think um, I I felt very much that I had to show up as a leader, you know, in um, in our boarding school a leader representing tough swimming, a leader at school, right, as head girl. And so from a really early age, I was thinking about that very deeply, the type of leader I wanted to be. And I didn't have it all figured it out and I made a lot of mistakes, but I think that's the first thing. When I think about tax, I feel like it defined a lot of my leadership. Um, and so that's the first thing. I yeah. think, um, the second thing is around uh, community. I think a lot of, um, and, the, and the importance of community. A lot of my closest friends, some of my most intimate conversations happened in life uh, on tax campus where a lot of my other dreams were birthed. It wasn't just swimming. It was, you know, someone 
on tax campus actually was what planted in my head to become a diplomat, right? And so all these like very pinnacle moments in my life, I remember sitting on tax campus having these conversations. So that community was another element that's just so important. Um, and then resilience, you know, I um, when you're an athlete, no matter what discipline you're in, you know, you will go through adversities. You're going to face like ups and downs. And it's just about digging in and working through that, but also making sure that you take care of your mental health, take care of yourself. Mm. Um, and so that like resiliency, I think also the resilience, I think of the stories of people that come through just the story of South African people that come from nothing, you know, bold lives and get degrees and go on, become CEOs at companies. Like, how can you not be inspired by that, right? Like inspired by people that are able to, you know, whose parents didn't even go to high school, uh, become all these amazing things. So you hear these stories about resilience and you're just sort of inspired. So those, those are like, I would say the three things that really stand out to me when I think about my experience at tax and the lessons learned and um, key things that I carry with me every day. Oh, wonderful. Uh, it sounds like uh, ideas put at the University of Pretoria's campus is pretty cool, but uh, I like those three things. And thanks for sharing that. Truly enjoyed uh, every bit of chatting with you today. I've uh, enjoyed uh, learning so much from you. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I feel so honored uh, to, to be with you guys today. So thank you for having me. Awesome. That's uh, uh, Yolana Duplessy Martin joining us all the way from New York and sharing all the exciting stuff happening to her. And uh, a lot of the foundation was embodied here at the University of Pretoria through the University of Pretoria's tax programs at the Swimming Academy. And uh, a true takeaway for me from this conversation is the fact that a purpose-driven life can really take you a little further than uh, your circumstances and also that uh, you can't hold on to one identity because that can limit you as she embraced multiple other opportunities she, she possessed and skill sets that she had so truly enjoyed that and uh, thank you for listening and thank you for joining us today you can find the LeadUP podcast at uh, www.up.ac forward slash lead up or wherever you find your podcasts uh, this season we'll be releasing the podcast the last monday of every single month and uh, this podcast is produced by the university of pretoria's alumni relations office our production team includes samantha castle alma schutz and our sound engineers will bring you this great audio quality uh, louis kluter production to meet again it's nothing but love and light on the side do take care goodbye